see my you guys see just my screen and not presenter mode just making sure this is going right yeah we're seeing you oh yeah we're seeing the um, slides okay awesome uh okay so thanks so much uh so yes i'm dan stein i'm the founder of giving green and really excited to chat with you guys today about what giving green is what we've been up to how we fit into the ea space um uh, We've been, we think we've been a member of this community, this effective environmentalism community since the start and excited to chat with you guys, get feedback, talk about what's next, et cetera. So, um, so what is, what does Giving Green do exactly? Well, basically, you know, like James said, we are an effective altruist inspired organization that try to help people deploy their money uh, to fight the climate change effectively. And so we're an, evidence-based, actionable vibe for climate philanthropy. We are incubated within ID Insight, which is a, uh, a nonprofit organization, mostly working in global development. We work super closely with people like GiveWell, et cetera. But Giving Green is a little bit of a semi-autonomous unit within ID Insight run by myself that has a, a bit of a different structure and different staff. But it is kind of nice that we can draw from you know, the expertise, the heft of, and the organizational structures of ID Insight uh, to achieve our mission. And our goal is to move 10 times our funding to high impact climate organizations. Um, and as you'll see, we actually achieved that goal a little bit ahead of target last year, according to our calculations. So that's us. Just what we're gonna do today, I'm gonna give a bit of an intro to Giving Green, uh, talk a little bit about and then I'm going to, you know, we, we do a bunch of different things that I'm going to talk about in the intro, but I'm going to dig down more deeply into our U.S. policy approach. I think that's the part that's a little bit more developed, where there's been a little bit more, uh, I mean, both traction and impact for us and a little bit more controversy. So I think it's, that's the interesting part. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about how we situate ourselves within other orgs in the EA community that are doing similar things, uh, where the... Um, where my basic idea is that while we're a little bit different, we think that there's room for a few players here and chances to be really complimentary and work together. Um, and if there's time, I'll get into a little some of our other uh, some of our other work streams around offsets and investment recommendations. But uh, I want to make sure we have time for like questions and open discussions. So at some point in the presentation, we might just uh, bag the PowerPoint <laughs> and uh, start chatting. So we'll see how far we get. Okay, so. So what is Giving Green's mission? Um, so the, our mission is to do everything we can to try to fight climate change. And, a lot, and the way we are trying to do that is by allocating, helping people allocate their money correctly. Now, I think one thing that's important to know when speaking to an EA audience is that doesn't necessarily mean just finding the best climate charities without any restrictions. That's, you know, that's part of our mission. But we are looking at other angles where, for instance, you know, people in Australia would not be interested to giving to, to U.S. policy. So we have some uh, some location specific recommendations. We also have recommendations targeted towards different groups like businesses or investors who would likely not give to policy organizations, which are our kind of frontline recommendations. And so we have different research areas and communication strategies targeted at these different audiences. And uh, so we're trying to create leverage we're trying to create impact through a bunch of different channels simultaneously. So a little bit about the, our different audiences. So we think we are trying to influence the donations of individuals and foundations looking to maximize their philanthropic impact. We're also looking at businesses, trying to influence as businesses that have made these carbon neutral pledges, uh, which we think are, are bunk a lot of the time and trying to be part of an ecosystem that is, uh, you know, trying to improve that space and and prevent greenwashing. Um, also, a, a somewhat newer part of our work plan is trying to offer advice to investors who are trying to make a positive climate impact with their portfolio. Again, uh, area where we think there's a lot of uh, disinformation and greenwashing. Okay, so so what are our high level conclusions that we have come to? Like, what do we tell donors? Who come to us and say, "What should we do to fight climate change?" And we're going to get to some of the why of these in a little bit. But I think the first, our first thing is that it's easy, and it's probably obvious to a sophisticated group like this. But it, it's easy to 
conflate issues of the environment with issues, with issues of climate change. And one thing we are pushing for is to say, to try and make the point that climate change is, is a, is I think the most difficult and befuddling social problem of our generation. And it needs to be treated separately and you have to focus on climate issues if you're gonna try and solve the climate problem. And sometimes this can actually be in, uh, in opposition to other other environmental causes like you know like preservation and so uh people need to at least think about that distinction crisply before they make their decisions um once you have a real focus on climate change and you're trying to make the hot, most high impact uh the most high impact interventions uh we think that people should be really targeting systemic change as opposed to funding small projects that are directly reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Um, we're, I'm going to show some evidence for that a little bit later, but essentially this means concentrating on policy and technology levers. And these two can be really intertwined, you know, with technology policy being a very fruitful area, which I think you hear from other EA groups as well, something we all really agree on. Um, and this focus is it's, it's supported by historical learnings. You know, if you think about what are the big things that have happened that have really made a difference for climate change, well, it's uh, technology improvements, sometimes driven by policy like solar and wind subsidies, um, and big policy arrangements like the the recent Kigali Amendment to the Montreal Protocol, uh, which is uh, seems like it's going to have a major impact. And we've also done some internal cost effective analysis that we'll get to. Okay, so. What are the like so-called products that we have right now? Um, well, we have this one on offsets and negative emissions that is targeted towards businesses that are essentially when you look at the spectrum of um, of giving opportunities, we think of these as the the high certainty ones. So short term, high certainty giving opportunities. Um, we don't really think that these are the highest expected value, but there's some subset of the market, mostly businesses, that's concentrated on this, and so we do some work there. Um, you can think of this like if you need an EA analogy, I think of this as like the give well S stuff, like really like inputs in carbon emissions out type stuff. Um, the other thing we do is U.S. policy. Like I said, we have this this belief that uh, that policy is the is the biggest lever that one can pull. I'm going to talk a little bit more about why we think focusing on US and Australian policy is interesting, but the, the, the proximal answer is that we felt we had comparative, well, there was both funding interest and comparative advantage, especially in the US, and funding interest in Australia. Both of these are high emitter countries that do not seem on the right track. So both seem like very fruitful places to start thinking about policy change. And I, as I mentioned, we started trying to think about investments with a real focus on the retail investor as opposed to like large sovereign wealth funds or ultra high net worth indiv individuals who I think have more tools at their disposal. Uh, anyway, we started, we've, we put out two reports, one on ESG funds and one on impact investing. Um, I think we just really scratched the surface there and are hoping to do more work on this in the future. Okay, so who are we? Um, we are three, well, I'm half time. We have two full time employees, Emily and Kim. Uh, we've worked with a number of consultants recently um, and we are hiring. So we'll get back to that later, but we are a growing team and we're hoping to add more faces to this list soon over the course of this year. Um, one thing that's uh, that I think I'm going to get to a little later that I think makes, again makes us a little different from some other EA organizations is we are really going for mass appeal with our product. And part of that means um, trying to get high profile media coverage. And we've fortunately been relatively successful in the last year of Vox, Forbes, New York Times, Time. Um, and that's a big, you know, a big part of our mission. Again, I'll circle back on this on like how can people help, but uh, getting our mission out there really, really widely is a big let's say you know it's just a big part of our value statement okay and i think since this is a group of eas usually i put this slide at the back of my presentations but because this is a group of eas everyone's going to say like what's your cost effectiveness what's your impact so we're putting it up front um we have a pretty i would say pretty sophisticated tracking system to try and track our influence of money moves it's obviously not perfect uh but we try really hard on it and we think that since we've launched we've driven around two and a half million dollars um, 
to our recommended organization. And this is based on a spend of around 200K, meaning we have roughly 10% leverage. Um, the counterfactual use of that money is hard to ascertain if you make some assumptions that I think are reasonable, but people could certainly um, could certainly argue with and do a, a bow tech on that. I think we give something like, you know, eight cents, like giving greens spending gives a greenhouse gas emissions of roughly eight cents a ton, which like kind of blows other solutions out of the water. So am I biased? Yes. Take that with a grain of salt. But that's what I think. Um, but then, you know, hearing from the organizations, we're, uh, we're, we're trying to work with relatively small organizations. Uh, we're pushing, especially in late 2021, our recommendations really pushed a lot of money to these orgs that they've described as transformational, shocking, um, very exciting, these kinds of things. So just a couple of quotes from a couple of our US policy orgs. Uh, okay, pausing to the next part, yeah, uh, James, does it make sense for me to just run through the whole presentation, then we'll do questions at the end, or do you guys normally do more of like an interactive thing? Um, I, I think it depends on what you want. I think if people want to drop in questions throughout, I think if there's like clarification, it's nice to have that throughout, but I think generally it's nice to do a Q&A at the end, but if there's anything clarifying in the middle. Um, yeah, I guess we've got a pretty big group, so maybe I'll just, I'll keep going, and, uh, and but people, people should feel free to put questions in the chat. Uh, maybe Emily, who's my colleague, can answer them, uh, and then, of course, I'll be I'll be definitely excited to answer questions at the end. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about our approach to US policy. Um, so, you know, like I said, we came to the early conclusion that we think one of the most, the, one of the most exciting perspective levers is, um, is policy change. Why did we focus on the US? Well, we're from the US. We thought we had a comparative advantage here. It also seemed like when we started in, in 2019, early 2020, like there's potentially this window opening for federal uh, federal legislation on climate in the near future, which seems to have happened. I mean, the window's open, not much has gone through the window, but, uh, but like a focus on US federal policy right now seems to make sense in the grand scheme of things. So what, what exactly do we do to try and find the top US policy organization? Well, our main tools we're using are desk research and expert interviews, along with cost effectiveness analysis. But essentially, we, we did sort of a, a funnel system where we started with taking the vast landscape of US federal policy levers, tried to put them into categories. And then through speaking with a lot of experts doing and doing desk research, we tried to narrow in on some specific strategies that we thought were uh, where there was where there was room for high effective philanthropic leverage. And those two buckets that we got more excited, that we were more that we focused on are insider and outsider policy advocacy. And just to give an idea of what we didn't focus on. So for instance, we didn't focus on organizations working through the legal system, organizations doing pure communications, or organizations trying to change the outcome of elections for various reasons. So anyway, once we focused on these insider and outsider policy advocacy orgs, we wrote these strategy reports on those strategies to try and understand well you know do we still feel confident about these strategies and what would effective organizations look like um, undertaking these strategies in this uh in this uh process we created long lists of potentially effective organizations that were working on these strategies in u.s policy um, and created shallow dives on these long lists so basically you can see these on our website they're one, one to two page reports on what does this organization do, um, what strategies it's using, what's its history of success, what's, it, but what's its budget look like, et cetera. And uh, we kind of, we have a definite focus on smaller organizations with lower budget where we think retail funders can make more of a, more of a difference. People might notice that a lot of the big names in US climate are not on our list, like say Sierra Club or EDF, that doesn't mean that these organizations are doing bad work. It just means that we don't think that, uh, you know, the marginal dollar is going to be as impactful for the so-called big greens. Anyway, from these shallow dives, we, we, um, we determined organizations that we thought were, were the highest prospect for being heavily cost-effective. And we did, we have these long deep dives and you can see them on our website for everyone we've done. 
where the organization history accomplishments, a, we mapped out a theory of change that I'm going to go through. We talked to lots and lots of people that we could work in the space and try to ask, you know, what impact are these guys really happening, really having, what would happen if they weren't there? What is, you know, what's their comparative advantage? What would they do with more funding, et cetera? And we also did some cost effectiveness new this year did cost effectiveness not modeling on many of these organizations um, to try and, you know, I think I'll get to it in a bit. I think cost effectiveness modeling of policy advocacy organizations is wrought with, uh, with uncertainty, sometimes to the point where you might say, what is the whole point of this whole exercise? But I think it allows us to, to get at least order of magnitude ideas of, of whether we think an organization is spending their money effectively. Uh, so, okay, so what does it look like? Well, basically we, this is just an example of one of the organizations. I think this is Evergreen Collaborative. It's more or less a like garden variety think tank executive or theory of change. Like what does it look like to try and be an insider policy organization? Um, and we wrote out a logic model of the theory of change. And then if you look at our deep dive reports, we basically look at all the assumptions you need to get to those links of each theory of change and then try and see if we think that there's evidence for each of those assumptions uh, to try and basically try and evaluate whether we think that the claims that organizations are making an impact are credible so that's one step and this is more qualitative we also undertook a quantitative analysis this year um, to you know, like i said to try and come up with some of this cost effectiveness and basically how this works is in the US, I actually think we had a real interesting opportunity to do cost effectiveness analysis in that there are these bills on the table, uh, what we call the infrastructure bill and the reconciliation bill. Uh, the infrastructure bill is, was passed as the uh, Investment and Jobs Act. I don't quite have that right. And then the reconciliation bill was the Build Back Better Act, which is dead, but will probably be resurrect resurrected in some form this year. Uh, but basically what we did is we, we tried to map out what we thought were the, over the next eight years, the climate impact compared to business as usual for all of the different, uh, all of the different climate related provisions of these two bills. And it's not perfect. You know, usually when we could rely on third party sources, uh, we did it, you know, for instance, for these incentives for clean energy, 80% clean energy, there were actually three separate academic or think tank studies that have tried to look at the difference between that and business as usual that all came to relatively similar conclusions. Um, we also have so occasionally we did the analysis ourselves, but we don't necessarily consider that to be our comparative advantage. We were looking for third party sources where whenever we could. Um, but basically put a number to every single uh, every single potential climate provision of the bills coming up. And then we uh, and then we created a logic model of what each organization was doing, like of uh, basically a logic model of the activities of the organization working through um, working through specific provisions of these bills. So for instance, some of the organizations we thought, you know, we're changing the probability that some of these bills in completion or some of these complete bills were passing. Some organizations were working on very specific provisions and therefore changing the probability that very specific provisions will pass. And so this is what we use to build our cost effectiveness model, which basically says like, okay, an organization is working on this specific provision. We think that this specific provision is going to decrease greenhouse gas emissions in the next 10 years compared to a counterfactual by 100 tons or whatever. Then we have to use our judgment based on all of the work we've done to say like, well, we think that the existence of this organization has changed the probability of this provision passing by X percent. That's the hardest part of the model. We look at a lot of ranges there. And then we look at what they've spent on that bill. And you can churn out a cost effectiveness model based on that. We have all this on our website. We have a web web based view. We also use guesstimate to look at a different range of parameters. This is, for instance, I think this is the cost effectiveness model of Evergreen Collaborative, some sort of histogram of we think potential cost effectiveness are plugging in, like doing a Monte Carlo, Carlo simulation of this model. So anyway, this is what we do. And, you know, 
I'm focusing more on cost effectiveness results for a EA audience because um, I think that's what how EAs are used to thinking of this. But the truth is, I don't think anyone should take our cost effective results too seriously. And we don't take it too seriously either. We think of them as just one tool to help us look at the whole ecosystem, what's going on and whether these things are effective. And the reason I say don't take it too seriously is they're just really wrought with a lot of uncertainties and a lot of assumptions that are uh, that are quite questionable. You should see these things as measured with a lot of error. But um, but I think the point I wanted to make is, you know, doing our best guess, when we look at most of these policy organizations, they're mostly coming in at uh, less than one cent or less than one dollar per CO2 per uh, ton of CO2 to removed, which we think is like pretty good compared to the suite of options out there. Um, we didn't recommend all of these orgs. These are just the ones that we did the cost effectiveness modeling for. Uh, and I think it's just interesting to compare that to these more certain options like offsets where, uh, where we also did cost effectiveness modeling for. Again, this isn't the price of, this isn't necessarily the price of the offsets in the market. If we get to the offset part, I'll talk a little bit about how we did, but we tried to calculate our own cost effectiveness of what we actually think buying these offsets will do. Um, and the, basically the point I wanted to try and make is if there's anything to take away from this cost effective model, it's that we policy orgs are just way more cost effective than short term certainty, high certain uh, interventions like carbon offsets. So um, like I said, don't take any of these numbers too seriously, but I think you should take away that policy is good. Okay, just want to talk a little bit about the three US policy orgs that we recommended and why we like them. So one of them is Evergreen Collaborative. It's uh, founded by former staffers of Jay Inslee, who was running for governor of Washington. He's, he was this presidential candidate who actually had a legitimate climate plan. He didn't really make it very far. Hello. All right. He didn't make it very far in the, in the primaries, uh, but some staffers of his organization created a nonprofit around this climate. Hello, plan. everybody. That they tried to uh, that they tried to um, essentially get the Democrats to adopt, and they did with pretty high effect. Uh, we think it's a nimble organization that's popped in the scene in DC, have out had outside effect, have done some really creative work in terms of trying to figure out how to get bills passed through reconciliation, which you can do with just a simple majority with the Democrats have, as opposed to a super majority with the Democrats don't have. Uh, so we think they're doing pretty amazing behind the scenes work. Lots of organizations spoke really highly of them. They have a really small budget, major room to grow. And especially they have this window this year of democratic control of the house where I think they can be uh, effective. Next one's Clean Air Task Force. I think for people who are paying attention in the EA community, this one shouldn't be a surprise. Lots of people like them. We like them too. Uh, pushing for technology change, uh, trying to hit really neglected areas on technology investment um have a really strong team very creative strategies working in a bunch of different areas uh, but like so they've historically worked on things like nuclear and carbon capture they're moving into new areas that seem really promising like uh decreasing emissions in africa and green hydrogen so uh they seem to they're they, they're just a, an organization working on lots of interesting neglected things and they've had a lot of success they're also a lot bigger than they used to be um so there's some worries about that Another one's Carbon 180, another one that should be relatively familiar to effective altruists, but um, an org that's focused on developing and implementation, implementing carbon removal, working through policy levers. This used to be super neglected. I think there's an argument that it might be a little bit less neglected now, uh, but I still don't think, I still think these guys have shown some really, um, really impressive wins at the federal policy level. There's not really anyone else doing this, and I think that they, they have the opportunity for plenty more impact in the future. Okay, um, so moving on, I wanna talk about situating Giving Green with an EA community. And if any of you guys came here for the drama, this is the part where we talk about the drama. So, um, you know, if, if you Google Giving Green, the second hit you get is this EA forum post with a lot of criticism of some of our early work and a lot of back and forth. 
Um, it's a little embarrassing for us, but it was, it's also, I think, good for us in that we got um, a lot of criticism, a lot of feedback from some early versions of our work. And, um, and we've been working on it over the past few years. And I think some of the criticism we thought was quite good and some we didn't really agree with. Uh, but I want to talk a little bit about that criticism and our reactions to it and how things have changed over the last year since, uh, since a lot of that broke. So I think I would, there's a lot of stuff going on, but I, I think I would break down that criticism into three buckets that I want to talk about. Uh, one was this kind of major criticism that we weren't, didn't only have the most cost-effective things on the site and that therefore our less cost-effective options like offsets could be cannibalizing our more, more cost-effective options like policy recommendations. And there was specifically worry, you know, that we could be, we could be directing people that not to like less cost-effective options. Um, there was also some criticism that our analysis didn't include explicit cost-effectiveness modeling, uh, which is true, which was true, is not, not, really true anymore, but I want to talk about that. And the major point of disagreement was a disagreement over our recommendation of the Sunrise Movement, which um, I think like, quite a few active members of the effective altruist community thought was wrong. Uh, and so let's get into it. So the first thing, like, should we be doing, should we give, give, be giving recommendations that we think are not, um, are not the most cost effective, such as offsets? And I think that, you know, to a certain extent, we agreed with part of the criticism that policy is way more effective than offsets. But we, we never had a disagreement over this. Um, and we thought that a lot of the criticism we received was pretty good or was, was on the mark in that it wasn't so clear. Like for someone coming to our website, it wasn't really clear that some things were way more effective than others. And so we agreed that this was a problem, essentially, and we're happy that various people in the EA movement brought it to our attention. I think in defense of our work on offsets, this is just a, a market that is poised to explode. It's about in 2020 or something, it was a $1 billion market. Um, and the new report by McKinsey says it could be a $50 billion market in 2030. It's super flawed. And we think we potentially have a place to have a role to play in terms of uh, separating the wheat from the chaff. So we're still interested in playing in this market, at least for now. And so our solution has been to, to do a major, like a major reorganization and reframing on our website to essentially say that these offset recommendations should only be used by businesses, that we don't really agree with this thing about individuals calculating their carbon footprint and removing it. I'm not gonna get into it. I think that's a terrible idea. Um, but you do have these businesses that have made these net zero goals for better or for worse, they're in a box and within this box, they can try and find better options and they can try and learn about the offset market, see all of these problems with, uh, with normal strategies. So I think that our, that our reframing has more or less solved the problem. And we can see that through some of our data, which shows that like just a, a massive plummet in referrals from our website directly leading to offset purchases uh, with, while our policy, our policy uh, referrals skyrocketed. So we're, we basically think this works. We think that most offset purchases, even if we do influence them, they're not gonna come directly from like a point and click on our website. They're gonna come from a corporation calling up the companies and buying a bunch of offsets. So we feel pretty good that our, uh, our reframing has helped address this issue. <laughs> Next one, cost effectiveness models. So I think the, the major, the major uh, criticism on that thread was like, hey, there's no CEA here. How do we know what we're doing? So we tried, we, we actually got a grant from EA funds to help with this. We added CEAs to most of our policy and offset models. And um, I think that was good. I think it was a, a good push. I think that CEAs in this space are only partially helpful. I think when we step back and we look at our models, some of them seem kind of in the right area. Some of them, we feel like we're just so uncertain that like maybe we step back and we wonder whether we actually gained anything from the CEA exercise. But I think the, the idea of giving it a shot really helps. I think that it helps at least helps people see our logic and are able to criticize it more carefully. Maybe you don't agree with some of our cost effectiveness models, but at least you can see what parameters you disagree with. So uh, 
So I'd say thank you for that criticism. And I think we've taken it on board. And now we have a lot of CEAs. Great. Now, the third one that was the most controversial was this recommendation of the Sunrise Movement uh, that a lot of people thought was just way off base. And actually, when we received a grant from EA funds, the specific, like the main outcome of that was supposed to be to re reanalyze our work on activism and the Sunrise Movement, try and improve that research. And they didn't, they didn't say we had to reconsider the recommendation, but that was sort of the idea, like do more work on it and see if you come to the same conclusion because it's so controversial. And so we did, uh, we did a few things. So first of all, we did a reanalysis re of the activism sector. I said we had these sector reports to you know, try and dig deeper and understand whether we still think activism is a, a fruitful place for philanthropic, um, for, you know, for philanthropic impact. Again, re-reviewed the literature, spoke to experts, created a stylized CEA for activism in general. And we came to a pretty positive conclusion. We, we still feel like, uh, like activism is undervalued in the climate movement um, and that it, it's still a, a fruitful potential place for, uh, for recommendations for us. Okay, so we redid that, we didn't change our mind. Um, the second was taking seriously the chance that Sunrise could have negative effects. This is, is something, you know, people thought like, okay, they're too radical, they can prevent compromise, they could prevent Democrats from getting elected. Um, they could have all kinds of downsides that you guys haven't taken into account. So we tried to take this more into account, think about it deeply, spoke with a lot of experts. Our CEA for the Sunrise Movement explicitly modeled this downside in terms of basically decreasing the chance that compromise pills, bills get passed while increasing the chance that, let's say, far left bills get passed. Um, and talk, just talked to a lot of, and also like dug more deeply into the organization of the Sunrise, where they've made some public comments that don't seem that helpful about being say anti-nuclear. We're trying to really understand like to, to separate some of the rhetoric from what they're actually doing in terms of their advocacy efforts. And we came to the conclusion that we don't think this downside risk, we think that the down, downside risk is relatively slight and is massively outweighed by the potential upsides and historical upsides. So that's all in our new report. And um, essentially I would say that that we didn't really change our mind on this one. Uh, another criticism was that the drastic increase in funding for the Sunrise Movement has decreased its marginal effect. Uh, you know, they had these major wins as a small scrappy organization, but they'd have a mass, had a massive increase in funding in 2021 and 2022. And we, I think there was this idea that like, okay, they're not the marginal dollar, sort of their time has passed. They've maybe accomplished what they needed to accomplish and that therefore and they're also much bigger so maybe the marginal dollar doesn't have the same effect um and i think that this this criticism landed more squarely and when we started to dig deeper into what sunrise looked like now as a bigger organization and really follow their activities and influence closely in 2021 which was a time when we we were really excited about them having a lot of influence and keeping on the pressure and you know, pushing politicians to pass these big bills um, that we felt it wasn't really quite living up to expectations. They were struggling a bit. In, they had internal struggles as a larger organization. Uh, and that caused us to downgrade our estimate of their future potential and ultimately remove them from our list of recommendations. So we're happy to have received that criticism uh, in the end. We did remove them from the recommendations, I think for only not like the main reasons why people thought we should, but, uh, but partially, okay? Uh, and I think a little bit, I, you know, I, I wanna stop talking a little bit, but I just wanna talk very quickly about like Giving Green versus Founders Pledge. They're sort of these two organizations that are playing somewhat similar niches in the, in the EA climate change space. And so, uh, so the question is like, how do we both exist as, well, should we both exist? And assuming the answer is yes, what are the similarities and differences and how do we uh, make sure we're complementary? So I, I think that one of the things that's important to know is even though we sometimes like fight it out on the EA forum, I think that like 80, we probably agree on 80 to 90% of stuff, you know, like we're both arguing for focuses on big system, systemic change we're both arguing for policy advocacy and technological innovation, and we both have concentration 
support for small growing organizations, uh, which is why we come to a lot of the same conclusions. I mean, we recommend some things Founders Pledge funds. Uh, most of the grants the Founders Pledge Climate Fund makes seem pretty reasonable to me. Uh, we have a lot of, so, you know, so I think that's, uh, that's pretty good. I think that there are some differences that are worth talking about. I think the main one is that we are more bullish about the prospect of high, of organizations that are working to remove, to reduce domestic emissions, especially in the US and Australia. So Founders Pledge has really pushed to say, you know, we think that rich, the rich country space are not, ne not neglected. So we should be trying to reduce emissions in developing countries. Uh, we're not so convinced about that. We don't think things are on, on track in these countries. We think that there are specific strategies that are that are neglected and uh, and could be used to great effect. So, uh, so that's a bit of a difference in where we've come down. Um, one of these things is these different categories. Founders Pledge has the Climate Fund. They're trying to attract money mostly from EAs looking to do the most good and um, and just try and find the most high impact uh, high impact options. So we have this slightly different strategy in terms of trying to speak with different audiences outside of the EA movement, which I think necessitates providing recommendations in different categories like offsets. Um, and part of that is we have this major focus on communication, public and public outreach that I don't think Founders Pledge has, where we're really looking to blast out our message through the public, uh, you know, change small giving, change the giving of work closely with small foundations who are developing their strategy in more of a consultant style relationship. Um, and uh, which I just think is like, is different than say, trying to get people to donate to the Founders Pledge Climate Fund, which is mostly EAs and Founders Pledge members. So a different strategy. You know, I have a bunch more slides, but this was what I said, I would absolutely stop sleep speaking by 945. And so I'm just gonna stop. Oh, okay, actually the very last thing, I'm just gonna put one more slide up, which is that if um, if anyone is interested in helping or getting involved, we're always looking for feedback. We are hiring, it was a little late in the hiring process, but uh, you could still throw your name in the ring and surprise us, but we'll be hiring again in the future, so don't worry. We might be open to interns, we're open to connections and you know we're supported by donors so contributions are always accepted now i'm really stopping over to you james um great yeah that, that was a lot that was amazing um you know I, I think emily's actually been doing a pretty amazing job at answering a lot of the questions in the chat but if there's any other questions maybe either be yeah, put in the chat or you can put your hand up via zoom and i can call you but maybe if you want to answer that one that and I just had about like why Australia because you want to talk a bit more about that and then Charlie has a question as well yeah okay so Australia I'll be 100% honest it was it was due to like an opportunity from a specific donor essentially the Australian Ethical Foundation is a five billion dollar uh, ethical fund in Australia and they also donate 30% of their profits to charity and so they wanted our advice and, but they can only donate within Australia. So essentially they wanted our advice on where they should allocate their money. Uh, they liked giving Green's recommendations. So they, they hired us almost more like a consultancy organization, but then as part, of our, as part of what they wanted was to open source these recommendations in order to potentially pull in more organizations from the public. So that's, that's why Australia, like we had this very specific opportunity to influence a big donor in Australia um and then of course we wanted to make the uh the recommendations public right and charlie you've got your hand up if you want to go for an ask question uh yeah sure thank you uh that was a really interesting talk um i was wondering so i, I totally agree with the idea of, sort of going uh, going for systemic changes aiming at policy organizations i was wondering what you thought of sort of environmental law charities people like client earth earth justice who instead of like trying to shape the law uh, aim to uphold the law like do you think they have a big impact or they seem quite good to me but i, I don't yeah to... yeah i you know uh, do i like them the answer is yes i think when we we've done this prioritization exercise in both the us and australia and in both of them we considered environmental law organizations so uh specifically earth justice in the us and the environmental policy organization or the environmental defenders office in australia 
And they both always just kind of fell out when speaking with experts, when doing internal prioritization. Um, it just, the I think that the, where we've landed on them and where a lot of people give us advice on is that, you know, just the, the changes you can make on the legal side are, um, are always on the margins, right? It's, it's always like working within the law, how do you interpret this law? Or maybe you declare this law unconstitutional or something like that. Um, when you think of like big drastic changes in climate, they're probably gonna come from legislation and not from legal. And legal, I mean, at least in the US is also really expensive. So when you start thinking about high level cost effectiveness, it doesn't seem quite as good. I mean, the counter argument is that you can actually win legal battles and sometimes you can you can fight for decades on legislation and it doesn't happen. So I would say that I like, I have a weakly held opinion that legal organizations are not as effective as legislative organizations. But, um, you know, there's clearly some of these legal organizations doing really good work. So I don't think I would fault anyone for saying like, I'm gonna go give to earth justice because, there's enough uncertainty that I'm not really sure. And these organizations have been quite effective. Nice, uh, good question. Uh, on the, keeping going with uh, asking Dan about different organizations, what are your thoughts on Citizens Climate Lobby? This came in from Kate on the policy side, because I guess it's a similar org in terms of policy advocacy. Yeah, so we, <clears throat> we did a shallow dive into Citizens Climate Lobby. They definitely fit the archetype, archetype of the kind of organization in the U.S. that we're excited about in that they're, uh, they're this, you know, outsider organization with, I guess one thing I didn't mention is that with the, you know, with removing Sunrise, we're in a little bit of an awkward position where we came to this conclusion that we're excited about outsider organizations being an important part of the ecosystem. We don't have any recommendations from them since we dropped Sunrise. And we actually struggled to find ones uh, that we're excited about. So we have looked in the citizens climate lobby. We didn't do a deep dive into them. We did a shallow dive. And the reason they fell out is that at least in their, at least when we looked at them closely about a year ago, they're just, just laser focused on this uh, tax and dividend strategy that when we started to talking to people more deeply involved with the political sausage making, everyone just said like, that idea has no traction in policy right now. The, the Democrats have have gone in this completely different, uh, in a completely different direction, centered around some of the tenets of the Green New Deal, which some people call this standard justice and investments uh, strategy. Which is, you know, it's basically like big government push for the uh, for climate rather than implementing implementing a tax. So. It was our belief that, like citizen, that by by focusing on the tax, citizens' climate lobby was just really not having a lot of influence. Like we didn't hear any. Like in fact, we asked specifically about it to the type of people who sit at these discussions, and they all said, you know, they're not there. No one's talking about the policy that they're interested in. Um, so, so we didn't move forward with them. You know, I like them as an idea. I think that they they've been around for a while. They have a lot of we have a lot of members, but it was our assessment that they just weren't having a lot of influence right now. Cool. Uh, I've got questions as well. I guess in terms of like giving green more generally, I guess what are, what are your plans over the next like three years in terms of do you want to be someone like maybe give well that's maybe like much bigger staff and even has your own giving pot, you want to do your own incubation grant. So I guess where do you see the focus of giving green over the next few years? Uh, I sort of had a slide on this, but I've lost it, so let's just quit that. Um, the I don't see us being as big as GiveWell. I think our ambitions are to have a staff of, let's say a handful of researchers, three to four researchers, a full-time dedicated comms person, and a couple like an ops person plus myself, you know, a staff of let's say eight to 10 um, and really be pumping out I think recommendations in a bunch of different categories and really staying on top of things and being able to change quickly. I think one thing that's different now is we've sort of had this yearly cycle of when we've released recommendations and as we get more full-time staff, we're hoping to be in the position where we can just make recommendations on the fly. Uh, I think I think the um, comparing us to GiveWell makes sense, but GiveWell is just like huge with a really gigantic budget and I don't ever quite see us 
uh, see us getting there. Um, I think we would like to, uh, I think we would like to have a fund like the climate change fund, or at least make giving to our organizations easier, which we haven't quite figured out the logistics of that yet. Um, I think I do see a future where we're separate from ID Insight. Uh, not 100% clear if and when that will happen, but I think that's a little bit of a of a more robust long-term organizational structure. Cool, interesting. And on another question, Chinmu said, do you ever communicate your cost effectiveness results back to the charities? And I guess, what are their reactions like and do they reuse them? And yeah, I guess, how's that kind of handled? Uh, they, yeah, well, we do. I mean, we do communicate them back to the charities. They all read, especially the ones who are recommendation, re recommended, their comms people read those deep dives deeply and pull out bits for their, uh, for their, um, their publicity, you know, they say we've been recommended by Giving Green, and I, I can't remember at least one of them I saw in some public comms that they pulled out that cost effectiveness number and just like trumpeted it because it sounds good. I don't know if they've, if people have really uh, interacted with it on a deep level, like say, like asked us to change some of the parameters or whatever. Um, but I think, I mean, especially the policy orgs. And they get super excited when they see those numbers because when you think about when people think like what should it cost to reduce a ton of carbon people sometimes think about the social cost of carbon which you know might be fifty dollars depending on who you talk to or they think about like the cost of an offset in the california offset market which is like 15 to 20 dollars and so when somebody says like oh it's a dollar to remove carbon with this stuff people are like um, amazing uh amazingly excited uh, oh, I see Emily was saying something different. Um, oh, okay. I was mostly thinking of the orgs we did recommend. I think Emily was answering on the chat, thinking about the um, the orgs we didn't recommend. Um, and I've got another general question. Yeah. Is, I guess like Founders Pledge, I think I would say generally focus more on maybe emissions in like developing countries, maybe because they think that's where most emissions are going to be in the future. I guess, do you have like an idea of that take? And would you ever considering expanding from the US focus and Australia focus to developing worlds or do you think like for some reason you have a particularly strong case that maybe that is like less important than they might think it is no i don't think so i really do think that's important uh i think it's um i think and it's something that we're going to be looking to a bit more i think our disagreement is like they would say working to decrease emissions in the u.s is not important and i'd say i disagree with that but when they say we think like working to decrease emissions in the developing world is important. We also agree with that. I think we just haven't done it because we haven't felt like we really had the comparative advantage. Now that we have a, a larger team that we're building, we are going to look into doing that a bit more or you know, sharing notes with Founders Pledge if they're doing a lot of work, a lot of work on that. And what we found when we've dipped our toes in it before, we've just found the areas of philanthropic engagement to be like just really not obvious. You know, how do you decrease emissions in China? I think we, you talk to a lot of Almost anyone we talk to about that says like, you know, good luck trying to do that with charity. It's not going to happen. Uh, I think in Africa, there's a little bit, there's a little bit more, but it's, it's not like you go to some like African policy organization. There's 50, 60 countries that all have their different politics and their different energy needs. Uh, so it's, it's just a lot less straightforward to get involved with. But I do think on a high level, uh, we agree with that. I mean, one thing that you can do is push technology innovation that will, uh, that will be used by developing countries they develop and we agree with founder founders pledge that that's a really uh a really fertile place for uh, for philanthropic investment cool and andres is a good chat about have you ever thought about converting your co2 calculations into qualities or even dallies maybe then you can almost compare it to other global health interventions i guess yeah okay and then there's another question that i have is like do, do you see this more like a global health thing a long-term thing like a general Good thing. But maybe, yeah, that's that's really question. Good. maybe you can do Andres' question first. Then. I'll take Andres' question. <laughs> I, I think that's a really good question. The answer is um, I haven't seen it and we haven't tried to do it, but I have thought about it. Like you would really like to have comparisons across, across cause areas. I think there's so much uncertainty. I mean, you definitely have some in terms of like, I have seen some work on the effect of climate on health and I'm trying to think, I know I've seen like effects of climate on lives lost. I'm trying to think if I've actually seen qualities, but it's always on like very specific roots of like the direct impact of heat on lives lost. And there's all these other roots on like 
potential of conflict and water supply and migration that are definitely going to affect qualities that are so hard to get your head around. So, you know, I'm interested <laughs> if somebody knows something, but we haven't quite thought about how to wrap our heads around that. I think it's important for talking to the um, for, ta for talking to the EA community, where you have a lot of real climate skeptics within the EA community that think like it's just so much less important than X risks. And I've seen some of those, um, some of those calculations, and you're like, okay, well, if like you really have no discount rate, and like, you know, there's some X risk, it's hard to argue with that. But if you, but um, I, I just we could try and do it. I'm not sure if it would affect anyone. I'd love to see someone do it. I'm not quite sure if that's our niche. Uh, but I hear you. Yeah, and not Dave, as I, yeah. that you would do, but I was curious if there is some. I mean, frankly, um, partially affects some of my next job choices. I'm mean, a little further in as head of technology in one company's uh, affecting use of uh, transportation fuels. Uh, so oh, interesting. I guess James just posted a link to the EA forum where Hockey Hildebrand tried to do that, and I haven't actually seen this. So uh, maybe we can all go take a look and see what we think. <laughs> Yeah, I think it's quite interesting. I think he did it once and then someone redid it with like different assumptions and found the complete opposite result by like a factor of 80. So it's like, it's quite seemingly quite assumption contingent. Uh, but I think it's interesting nonetheless. <laughs> yeah, great. Um, I mean, I'm happy to take more questions. I also think we're probably technically out of time, but you know, I, I'm, I don't know, maybe we should like officially close, but then I'm happy to stay here and chat with people. Yeah, that sounds good. Um, well, maybe I'll do one final plug of yeah. the, the links I was going to plug, but otherwise we'll keep this room open. People want to keep asking questions and go for it. Um, well, the only thing I would say is actually Dan is the last talk we have lined up for, so we need more talkers. So please, if you know someone, uh, relevant, maybe a hard act to follow, but yeah, we need more people. So please sign up or like recommend someone offer to do one all that. And yeah, again, you can follow us on these various links below and we'll send a follow-up email with recording of a talk and hopefully Dan's slides, if you're happy to give us your slides, uh, then we'll send them, um, maybe some various links in the chat that are relevant. So yeah, that's everything for me. Um, any other questions? I will let people take the floor. Or Dan, if you if you have things you didn't cover that you really wanna plug now. <laughs> um, I just wanna share that, like how you can help screen that I somehow lost. Uh, I think that's the only thing. I mean, I, I, I don't think it's worth, we have this work, we have work on offsets, we have work on investments. Um, you guys can read that. I don't think it's a good use of everyone's time to like go through the rest of my slides that I didn't cover. Um, but I am interested in just saying like, like, okay, I'll just say it. I'm having trouble with the slides. I mean, I just think, uh, you know, we're really interested in engagement from the effective ultra effective environmentalist community. We're interested in, uh, you know, we, we, we're always looking for more press. <laughs> and I, I know that sounds self-serving, but it's like, that is our mission is to get the world out there. And it's, it's really different, I think, than some of the EA organizations. So if anybody ever knows like a journalist or a podcaster doing stuff on this, you know, we're, we'd love to have connections. We are very frequently looking for collaborators, meaning like, um, meaning, full-time hires or consultants or interns or general partners. You know, I'm sure you guys are out there working for all kinds of different organizations and like we're interested in various types of partnerships. So I think people should, uh, you know, people should reach out and, and we're looking for donors. I don't know if like this group are people with fat pocketbooks, but you know, maybe you know people or you ever talk to someone. Uh, we're not like, like we are fortunate enough to have recently received a a grant that keeps us going for a little while, but like, we're pretty ambitious. We want to hire more people. We want to do more stuff. And so, you know, we're always running into our money constraints. Uh, Andrea says, all right, is there any connection to some of the large donors or venture funds and their investment DCs? Um, and we have a connection to, um, to FTX and Sam Bankman-Fried. They funded us before. Um, and I'm not quite sure where that relationship is going. We've been working to try and like increase it. We'd love to be a 
he's really interested in climate. We'd love to like be an influence to him and we're, we're trying to get there, <laughs> but uh, yeah. And then venture funds. So I guess, I guess the other large donor is this like EA funds. They're like, or sorry, not EA funds. Um, uh, Australian ethical in Australia, they're this big fund that sort of hired us and pushed the investment work. Um, but we would, we're looking for connections to more large donors and, uh, and venture funds. I mean, I, I don't know if we're an obvious uh, link to the venture fund, like these climate venture funds, like say lower carbon capital or whatever, those guys have their own team. They have their own investment thesis. We're not really, with our investment stuff, we're not really looking to like be the research arm of an investment house. We're more looking to play with, like to, to speak to smaller level investors who say don't have their own teams and like have a day job and don't spend all their time thinking about climate. So I don't think that's right. We'd, we'd definitely be interested in connecting to large donors though. <laughs> yes, of course. Yeah, and I was, I was thinking even just to hear what their points of view, why they're investing in certain companies uh, or efforts and see if you can leverage each other. Yeah, but do you mean the like for-profit ones or the non-profit ones? Um, both, um, like a couple of companies I'm looking at have for-profit and non-profit um, funding. And so there must be some similar research there saying, where are we putting it? Yeah, yeah, I mean, I'm super interested in that. I mean, I, we have like, personal connections to some of these big venture funds and we swap notes on like, what are the big sectors coming on? I mean, but I found that these guys have a pretty somewhat of a different lens, like especially the for-profit people are like, you know, they're looking for profit. Um, we have, we have friends, like we have a couple of our advisors at, at these big, that are on these big climate philanthropies and we're always trying to compare, uh, to compare notes for them. I think, a, I think for us, like a, a really winning strategy for us that we would love Maybe even the exit strategy would be the, you know, basically how GiveWell found major success is they just like, they were this little scrappy org and suddenly this major donor was like, okay, you direct all of my $50 billion, whatever. I mean, that would be like an amazing endpoint for us. And it wouldn't even have to be that big. You know, we talked to a lot of smaller family foundations that are giving out like 10 million a year or something like that. And we're quite, we'd, we'd be really happy if one or two of those just kind of adopted us and said like, Okay, we're going to do what you guys say in the same way that Dustin Moskowitz does for Givewell and Open Phil. Um, that's, yeah, we haven't we we have like some influence in some of these foundations, but we've never had someone just adopt us. <laughs> so we're 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 excited about that prospect, and I actually think that that's a good niche for us because you do have these, you do have these smaller organizations that are really into climate and don't know anything about it, and that's where we're like, hey, like we're here for you. Like you don't need to hire your whole. I was going to ask on, on that. I guess, have you had much engagement with like other climate foundations, like maybe uh, Climate Works and stuff, in terms of like, I guess what what they think of your recommendations versus their own grants, and like maybe where the differences are. Yeah. So I mean, we haven't talked systematically with them, but we actually have one. We have someone from Climate Works Foundation on our board of advisors. Also, someone from the Preston Warner Foundation, and so we, we do talk a lot about. Definitely with climate works, we have this direct line where I'm like, hey, what's climate works doing? Like, what do you think about this? And it, climate works is sort of hard because they invest in everything like across the board. So I'm like, you know, when I say like, what do you think about methane? Or like, what do you think about US policy? They're always like, yes, it's important. Everything's important. <laughs> so I have trouble getting that. But I definitely have. Uh, but one thing that we have been doing is using these connections to try and understand what, what looks to be neglected. Like this methane one is a, is a good example. We've been looking into methane. There's been a big methane pledge recently made where Climate Works is sort of a, a uh, is like a, a bit of a coordinator of that effort. And what we've been trying to do is say like, okay, like where are you guys, where is this investment going to be? Because we think, for instance, like we're really interested in this idea of decreasing livestock emissions, specifically from beef. Um, and I'm like, well, what are you guys going to be doing this? Or are you going to be just concentrating on oil and gas and okay, are you going to be doing this fermentation stuff? Or are you actually going to be working on reducing meat consumption, which our research is showing us to be a potentially, uh, fertile area. And so, 
yeah, so that's help. That is, these conversations are helping trying to weave our way to try and understand what they're doing and trying to hit parts where they're not. We don't have a relationship with all of these big funders, but um, we've got someone we can call at Hewlett. We've got an advisor at Climate Works. So we've got, you know, like a few people who are connected. Um, okay, anybody else? Awesome. Yeah. Well, our, our our attendance has dwindled, so maybe we should just let everyone go. <laughs> yeah. I mean, everyone, well, at least, at least in the more European side, people can go enjoy their Friday evenings, and you guys can yeah. I guess get, get on with your work day and get to work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Just, just my um, question, James: How did attendance on a Friday compare to your normal attendance on a Sunday? Ah, uh, well, this was actually better than the last few talks for sure. But I don't know if it's you or if it was the timing. <laughs> I, I think it might have been even green as a whole. But it's, it's, right. it's, it's really hard to tell. So maybe we'll do some more ones at this time, and we'll see what happens. At least but, we didn't screw up too terribly with this timing. That's what I was. No, no, I think sorry, sorry, it was pretty decent. Um, yeah. that's like it's better than definitely the last two or three. So it's quite good. Um, cool. so yeah. Okay. Congrats. All right. Um, Cool. Um, in that case, thanks everyone for coming. Dan, Wait, if you hold on. Your before slides. you close it, Emily, can you save the chat before we go? Because <laughs> once you close Zoom, the chat disappears forever. I think, James, um, if you're recording it, that should keep the chat, right? Oh, I mean, okay. I've, okay. I, I've saved the chat as well, so it's all good. Oh, okay. Yeah, good, I, good. I'll send it to you guys in a full email. Okay. Um, oh. Cool. Do we have a question? No? Okay. 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 Take care. Thanks, thanks guys. Everyone. Okay. Bye. Bye.